Spotlight, lectures and performances on and around Albany State University. Uh, good morning. I thought uh, it's a real pleasure to be here today um, and uh, reading for you this morning. Uh, I want to thank Dr. Hill for all his uh, hospitality and um, it's been a lovely visit so far. I'm going to read um, <clears throat> a few poems but first I thought I'd read from a book of, I have forthcoming. It's be out next month. It's called The Grey Album on the Blackness of Blackness. It's about music and literature, and the part I'm going to read today uh, is about soul music. Yeah. <clears throat> Growing up, I wanted to be a pip, not in the sense of something small or insignificant, but rather, sorry, there's something under here opening, but rather one of the pips spinning and singing behind Gladys Knight while she sang, he's leaving on that midnight train to Georgia. Even at the time, it was clear to me I wanted some of what soul music provides, a sense of praise even among the heartbreak, to hold your head up high and bow only when dancing, or as pip can mean, to break through in hatching. Choreographed yet spontaneous seeming, stylish and sating, soul learnt me that blackness could mean an afro in a tuxedo. To riff off one of the other definitions of a pip, Soul turns what might otherwise be tragedy into a minor, unspecified human ailment, taking its cue from the blues, seeing beauty among the bittersweet. Soul can make even heartbreak look good. Dry long so when night takes her own midnight train, singing, I'd rather live in his world, the pips behind her echoing, live in his world, than live without him, long pause for effect. In mine, we know full well where she's been and where she's headed. This living in two worlds is also a condition we've seen before. Whether in Du Bois's double consciousness or in the spirituals claiming an otherworldly future, the midnight train journeys between here and there, the midnight special between there and elsewhere. People get ready. There's a train a coming. There are always two trains running. In soul music, the dueling trains of heaven and hell become the love train or friendship train. They'll go on in hip-hop to be bombed subway cars and then Trans-Europe Express retrofitted to reach planet rock. In Midnight Train, capitalize the his in the phrase, I'd rather live in his world than live without him in mine. And you can see how close we are to the holy role. In Night's song, Indeed, in her very singing, we see up close the ever-present tension between the spiritual and the secular, not just as two competing parts of culture, but within each of us. Midnight Train to Georgia conveys us not just with its chug-chug rhythm, but also, like so many blues and folk songs before, with train imagery. Its blues correlative is surely part of the song's persistent popularity, of course, all the correlative in the world would mean little without Gladys Knight's emotional delivery touched with restraint. Yet, in the, in the eternal battle between emotion and restraint, restraint here is chiefly performed by the pips themselves, who serve as a chorus commenting on the first person action, the wrenching decision that Knight enacts and helps us to know. Their black Greek chorus not only echoes but predicts the action. All aboard, they sing. And soon Knight is singing it too, saying, I got to go, I got to go. And boy, do we believe her. We realize suddenly we've been listening to someone convincing herself to leave all along. In this case, to find her way to what must feel like home. This is all the more powerful because it appears the singer is not coaxing forth the song, but that the song itself is convincing the singer. Knight ain't singing. The song is singing her. Such singing is hard to do, 
at least without having the song overwhelm you, as many lesser singers might. I recall a too young singer on television's American Idol doing just that, taking the song as a lighthearted romp, an upbeat number more reminiscent of Boogie Woogie Bugle Boy. The other risk is there too. Many a good singer, from Whitney Houston to Mariah Carey, faced with such a song, rather than trusting it, take your time now, will overpower the thing, oversing it, blow it out. You can hardly blame them. It is scary to let the song sing you. But soul insists not so much on perfect pitch as a perfect ear to find the heart of the song in all its senses. This is what I call inner form. You could call it song's soul. So uh, that's from this book of essays I have coming out. And they're about music and literature and I suppose life. And this first poem I'll read is about James Brown. James Brown at B.B. King's on New Year's Eve. Right after he died, he died around Christmas, I saw that he was still listed to play on New Year's Eve. And I thought, well, what if he did? James Brown at B.B. King's on New Year's Eve begins with a quote from him. The one thing that can solve most our problems is dancing and sweat, cold or not, and burn ends of ribs or reason of hair singed and singing, the hot combs caress. Days after he dies, I see James Brown still scheduled to play B.B. King's come New Year's Eve ringing it in, us falling to the floor like the famous glittering midnight ball drop, countdown, forehead full of sweat, please, 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 begging on his knees. The night King was killed, shot by the Memphis moan in a town where B.B. King sang, St. James in Boston tells the crowd, cool it, a riot, on stage, heartache, rehearsed, practice, don't dare be late or miss a note, or you'll find yourself fined 50 bucks, a fortune. Even the walls sweat. A godfather's confirmation suit, his holler, wide collared grits and greens. Encore, exhausted after collapsed, carried out away off, not on a gurney, no bedsheet over his bouffant conch shining, but boots on in a cape glittering bright as midnight or its train. This is a poem about boxing. <coughs> Specifically about Muhammad Ali um, fighting foreman in uh, The Rumble in the Jungle, which is the title of the poem. <laughs> Rumble in the Jungle. If you didn't know better, you might think Muhammad was praying, not talking smack. Arms up, Ali leans way back, as if trying to catch a glimpse of the Almighty. He's told no one his plan to rope a dope to bend in whatever wind foreman sends or knocks out of him, haymakers and body blows. The thumbs of his old-fashioned boxing gloves upright like Ali hopes to hitch a ride to heaven. Instead, he's here in Zaire, stuck waiting for the monsoon, playing possum through seven rounds till it's time to climb and jab his way off the ropes like Tarzan sawing free from a fishing net in a Saturday matinee, swinging to foreman backstrokes to the floor. Seven whole rounds of reckoning till a woman in a dashiki stepping lightly carries the card for the next round filled with what now appears omen, inevitability. For one moment, the number eight on its side an infinity. So
Do people in this room listen to hip hop at all? Yeah. Some people do. Mm -hmm. I can't decide if I should read this poem, but you look like, like you might <laughs> listen to rap music. So this is called Ode to Old Dirty Bastard. F you, motor mouth, clown of class, warfare, welfare millionaire. How dare you disappear when we need your shimmy, shimmy yaw here. Osiris of this shiznit, your body's now scattered on wax. No monument, no fortune left, just what you made and spent, I hope. Good morning, heartache. Your carelessness reminds us how quick we are to judge, how serious things done become. Dirty as the South, sweet as neon cherry pie filling from a can. I hear folks still call your number in Brooklyn all hours and ask the sleepy, still listed Russell Jones, no relation, come out and play. Baby, I got your money. Big baby Jesus, dirt McGirt, alias addict, of course you can't be reached. You're too busy, rusty, wigging out, dancing in a hump suit and jerry curl toupee. Your tiny, tacky dreads hidden. Your grill of gold melted down to pay off St. Pete or Beelzebub to buy just one more dose of freedom. So uh, that's ODB. So uh, my most recent book is called Ardency, and I'll read some poems from that in a moment. But um, first I thought I'd read from Dear Darkness, which is a lot about my family in Louisiana, um, where my parents are from. And uh, they met at Southern University there. And um, I grew up going there a lot, summers, and um, it was, we moved around a lot. So in a way, it was my home away from home. And we still just call it home. I thought I'd read a few poems from that book. This one's called Aunties. Sometimes I go places and I read and I have to explain what aunties are, but perhaps you know what they are. Ants, I should say. Um, so this one's called Aunties. Sorry, it's going to take me a second to find it. Like I said, it takes place in Louisiana. And here it is. Aunties, there's a way a woman will not relinquish her pocketbook, even pulled on stage or called up to the pulpit. There's a way only your auntie can make it taste right. Rice and gravy is a meal if my late great aunt Tuda makes it. Aunts cook like, it's, like there's no tomorrow and they're right. Too hot is how my Aunt Tootie peppers everything, her name given by my father for seeing her smiling in her crib. There's a barrel full of rainwater next to the house that my infant father will fall into, trying to see himself the bottom. And there is his sister Margie yanking him out by his hair grown long as superstition. Never mind the fly swatter they chase you round the house and into the yard with, ready to whoop the daylights out of you. That's only a threat. Aunties will fix you potato salad and save you some. Godmothers, God sends aunt smoke like it's going out of style, and it is. Make even gold teeth look right, shining, saying, I'll be John, with a sigh. Make way out of no way. Keep the key to the scale that weighed the cotton, the cane we raised more than our share of. If not them, then who will win heaven? Holding tight to their pocketbooks at the pearly gates, just in case.
There's a number of blues in the book. Um, this one actually didn't make it in there, but uh, seems all right. I'll read it to you. Sugar water blues. I called her honey, shortbread, sweetie, but turns out I got diabetes. Sugar in my water like homemade Kool-Aid. My tongue, she stains, teeth rotting right out my mouth. Melted down every filling, hoping I'd have enough to make an engagement ring. She gets inside like fluoride. Ain't she something? If you see her, say so. Tell her she's forgiven like a loan. Then ask her for the rest of whatever I own. This, um, some later blues poems. <laughs> this is called Last Ditch Blues. Even death don't want me. Spiders in my shoes. Even God. I tried drinking strychnine or going to sleep neath the railroad ties. Always the light found me first. The law put me under arrest for assaulting a freight. Disturbing what peace? Turns out it was only strict eight. Tired of digging my own grave. Tired. Spiders in my shoes. The paper boy only sold me bad news and wet at that. The obit page said, not today. The weather blew too. Stones all in my shoes. Deep Six Blues. I overslept and was running late from my own wake. The professional mourners who came complained they were underpaid. What a eulogy my enemies gave. At least, at last, I made the funny pages. Man survives years without a heart. Like me, the daisies were on loan and from the old folks' home and on their way to being replaced by plastic. Thing is, I'm allergic, and even dead managed to sneeze my way through all the endless off-key singing. So as I was saying yesterday, I've been writing all these odes to sort of everyday things, including food. Um, mostly southern food, which, you know, I grew up eating, uh, I guess what people call soul food, but as my dad said, growing up, we just called it food. Um, <laughs> so, I thought I'd read you a few of those. This is an uh, ode to chicken. You are everything to me. Frog legs, rattlesnake, almost anything I put my mouth to reminds me of you. Folks always try getting you to act like you someone else. Nuggets or tenders, fingers you don't have. But even your unmanicured feet taste sweet. Too loud in the yard, segregated dark and light. You are like a day self-contained. Your sunset skin puckers like a kiss. Let others put on airs. Pigs graduate to pork. Bread become toast. Even beef was once just bull before it got them degrees. But even dead, you keep your name and head. You can make anything of yourself, you know, but prefer to wake me early in the cold. Fix me breakfast and dinner too. Leave me to fly for you. Ode to homemade wine. You are stronger than you think. <laughs> Quiet cousin of mine, my uncle made you and never knew till years later when you knocked at his door and called him father. Even his wife welcomes you home. We all seem loud with you around. You fix the front porch so it no longer leans. Take out the sting the day my daddy's buried, talking trash and laughing. You crazy, he would have said, which where I come from is a compliment. Mother 
of moonshine. You swore to get the jalopy in the lawn running again. I may get around to it yet. Though cloudy, you know better than anyone that death while hell may make folks better. You keep just this side of rotten. For you, we've had to come up with new names, fermented, brewed, settling in. But lucky for us, no funds. <coughs> Slow to anger, quick to act. You were the house my father was born in only last year, torn down to stop from falling on this one. The child's chair my grandfather or his father made, rocking wood. Painted a green that won't quit blooming, but must have seemed to most folks only old, tossed behind the house to rot with the blackberries. Saved, shipped, shaken free of mites. That rocker I found after my father's funeral is like you, rickety yet sturdy. You always do the trick. You never beg nor borrow, save all pain for tomorrow. Ode to Kitchen Grease. <laughs> Once we were close. Once we let you hold our children, cook up whatever you wanted, and cook you sure could. You put your foot in it, made food stick to our ribs. Gray grandfather, once clear, you grew cloudy with age, so we put you in a home and out of ours. Little diva, bent elder, you had grown to be too much upkeep and high pressure. Your nagging sent many favorite mother-in-law to an early grave. Still, some mornings you drop by uncool right after breakfast bacon's been made, sniffing around the kitchen and already asking, what's for dinner? And I sure wish you'd stay. <laughs> this is an ode to catfish, which I hope to have some today. So. <laughs> Maybe this will make it happen. <laughs> Ode to Catfish. Old man, despite your beard and bald head, you still ain't old enough to be dead. You swim back, slipping through my hands into the dark, and I wake. Even in dreams, you are dead. Your fresh, certain smell, cornbread batter frying in the pan, Morning still fills my face, and I am glad. No matter the pain it takes to hold you, your barbs and beard, you sustain me, and I wander, humming your hundred names. Brother, bullhead, paper skin, slick. Remember the day, po' boy, you fried up catfish with grits for breakfast, your mother and sisters surrounding us, and you declared it perfect. Sweet Jesus, you were right. Fish hooks in my heart, my plate full of bones. I'm scared to swallow. The last ode I read, I'll read is the last uh, poem in this book, and then I'll read some uh, newer poems. But this um, <coughs> is Ode to Boudin. And in Louisiana, Boudin is sort of like, uh, you perhaps know, but it's sort of like fast food almost. Any corner store has their own Boudin, and you uh, fight over what's, who's the best. Um, so I'll read uh, this poem, Ode to Boudin. And it's basically, you probably know, a sausage casing with uh, meat and rice uh, spiced. Oh, to Boudin. You are the chewing gum of God. <laughs> you are the reason I, I know that skin is only that, holds more than it meets. The heart of you is something I don't quite get, but don't want to. Even a fool like me can see your broken beauty. The way out in this world where most things disappear, driven into ground, you are ground already. And like rice, you rise. Drunken deacon, 
sausages, half brother, jambalaya's baby mama. You bring me back to the beginning, to where things live again. Homemade savior, you fed me the day my father sat under flowers, white as the gloves of pallbearers tossed on his beer. Soon, hands will lower him into ground richer than even you. For now, root of all remembrance, your thick chain sets me spinning, thinking of how, like the small, perfect, possible, silent soul, you spill out like music, my daddy dead, or grief, or both. Afterward, his sisters, my aunts, dancing in the yard to a car radio, tuned to Zydeco beneath the pecan trees. So that's a little from Dear Darkness. This, these new poems um, take up sort of the question of my father dying a bit uh, more, um, and less through the sort of metaphor of food, and uh, which was you know both sustaining and uh, reminiscent of him, um, but sort of of the experience of the time after he died, which was very sudden, and so um, it's a strange sort of moment. I guess they're exploring what it's like after someone you you love passes. This is called wintering. I'm no longer ashamed how for weeks after I wanted to be dead. Not to die, mind you, or do myself in, but to be there already walking amongst all those I'd lost, to join the throng singing, if that's what there is, or the nothing, the gnawing, so be it. I wished to be warm and worn like the quilt my grandmother must have made one side a patchwork of color, blues green like the underside of a leaf, the other an old pattern of the dolls of the world, never cut out but sewn whole, if the world were Scotsmen and sailors in traditional uniforms. Mourning, I've learned, is just a moment, many grief, the long betrayal, sorry, the long betrothal beyond. Grief what we wed, ringing us, Heirloom brought from my father's hot house. The quilt heavy tonight at the foot of my marriage bed. Its weight months of needling and thread. Each straightish, pale, uneven stitch like the white hairs I earned all that hollowed year. Pull one and ten more will come wearing white to its funeral. Each a mourner, a winter, gathering ash at my temple. So uh, I think I'll read this one from him, from this new book. It's a short little one called Dream the Day After Easter. Dream the Day After Easter. He said being dead was a little like living, only longer. <laughs> I never knew that was funny, so. <laughs> Strange but true. This one's called Pity. Pity. The cookies his neighbors brought by didn't taste like pity. At my father's house, for the first time after the locks broken into, now new, when cross the street comes a neighbor, cookies 
shrouded in tin foil, a plate I need not return. How long had the pair kept vigil out the window for someone to set foot here so they might make their offering? Had they begun baking soon as they heard, knowing full well the dead and those closest to them grow hungry like bread, the body rising? Inside his house filled with what killed him, a dozen turkey decoys deflating bright empty shells. Another kind soul had taped a tarp over his open sunroof top. Disarray the rest. Who knows what goes where? After all, it is dirt we return to, or fire we devour. The pool we once swam out back, now drained, flooding the street in mock calamity. No longer the filter sucking its lower lip and teeth like a child trying hard not to weep. Just to change it up a little bit, I'll, I'll read some other poems from the book. Um, this poem is called Expecting. Expecting. Grave, my wife lies back, hands cross her chest while the doctor searches early for your heartbeat, peach pit, unripe plum, pulls out the world's worst boombox, a Mr. Microphone, to broadcast your mother's lifting belly. The whoosh and bellows of mama's body, and beneath it, nothing. Beneath the slow stutter of her heart, nothing. The doctor trying again to find you, fragile fern, snowflake, nothing. After, my wife will say in fear, impatient, she went beyond her body, this tiny room, into the ether. For now, we spelunk for you one last time, lost canary, miner of coal and chalk, lungs not yet black. I hold my wife's feet to keep her here and me, trying not to dive starboard to seek you in the dark water. And there it is, faint an echo faster and further away than mother's all beatbox and fuzzy feedback. You are like hearing hip hop for the first time. Power hijacked from a lamppost, all promise. You couldn't sound better, break dancer, my favorite car bumping from a passing car. You've snuck into the club underage and stayed. Only later, much, will your mother begin to believe your drumming in the distance, my Kansas City and Congo Square, this jazz band vamping on inside her. This poem's about spring, uh, which seems like it's right around the corner though. It's February, I know. This is called Thirst. What blossoms is loss. Last year's ash fills a tin from the grill that fed us all last summer like a father. That black belly rusty, it's great you scrape, hopefully not too clean. The past where taste lives, seasoning, sudden weeds taller than even you dreamed, bending bare arms to the earth to yank them out by their hair. The hollies finally given up on, the dead harder to root out than you'd think. Worms weaving round the dirt, black, lush, clinging. The ferns somehow returned, planted in that heat wave last summer, remember. Sweat stinging the eyes, wilting. Now their green palms wide open in offering. The steady consolation of things returning, lilac, and dogwood, sweet woodruff, even the stones shine in the sun. White blooms, soon gone. Soothing thud of the neighbor girl playing catch, cat gut kissing leather 
or missed the ball landing soft in our yard's deep grass. So sorry for your loss. Only the tulips refusing to rise this spring, stung by the freezer we kept them in all winter. Like any good son, mine still tends the dirt, watering the bulbs long after they're done. With his little cup, tries to fill the darkness up. I'll just read a couple more. This is called Gravity, um, and it's um, about the West Coast. Where I lived for a while in dry, uh, taking a drive from Los Angeles to uh, San Francisco, which takes about five hours, which um, isn't much around here, but for some people that's far. Gravity. I've tried telling this before. How the light stabbed its way out of the clouds, rays aimed everywhere. No, it was the earth that day drawing light out of the sky, heavy. Gravity pulling the light to rest on its chest, a ladder leaning. In the valley north of the city of angels, mountains around us, my passenger a twin, one half of two. Their mother killed a year or so before, helicopter catching a power line, gone, and I, knowing nothing then, or too much, said a little, maybe sorry, which isn't all you can say, but mostly, though I didn't know that then. And we were fighting with my warbling tape deck, no doubt, when we saw it tumbling, end over end, across the highway, a car flipping and spinning up dust, and God knows what else midair, and almost before I could reach the shoulder, my friend out across the lanes, racing to the crumpled car, to his mother. Even then, I knew it was her he hoped to meet. Instead, in the scorched grass of the median, a spare or spared shoe, books flapping their wings, and a man dazed somehow thrown clear, kneeling. We were not the first, already some off-duty nurse or Samaritan beside him within seconds, asking what I should have. Are you all right? He held no answers, no language for where he had just been, almost stayed. The car turtled over on its back, its brokenness that could be our bodies, not yet our lives or his and my friend, the twin, almost there in time. Me slow behind, the last of the first, scared to see, looking on in horror and wonder, clothes tossed everywhere now no one would wear. The broken mirrors missing bodies they were once conjoined to, closer than they appear. A blinding, splintered sky, helpless, we soon would turn and sail off under. And this last poem is uh, the last poem in my new book, Ardency, which um, is a long poem about the slave uh, rebellion on the Amistad. But it has a series of choirs throughout it. It ends with a libretto in the voice of the rebel leader, Sinke. And I thought I'd just read the last one, which is a benediction. Choir, morning. May the river remember you. May the road be your only cross. May you rise. May your son, not the silence, take your hand. May the lost, may the mountain move to meet you. May the climb be quick. May the mountain, may the sea shut at last its door. May the moon, may the ash, not the snow. May the ground swallow you whole and the sun. May the last be the first. May the lost, may the stars for once be still. 
forget heaven. May you wake again with the rain. Thank you very much.